Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hear you now. Great. Very good to meet you, sir. Good meeting you too, James. It's beautiful. You look good. Uh, I like that flag. Very powerful. Oh yeah, it's the uh, DNR flag and the Texas flag. Yeah. And I like your flags too. Yeah, New Zealand and Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we're recording now, but I can I can take anything out. I just want you to know, uh, Russell. Did, Russell is okay. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, sure. Okay. I just want you to know that I've, I'm a follower. Um, I, I appreciate what you're doing. This will be an honorable interview, and I'm a supporter, and I uh, respect what you're doing, and um, be safe, man. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so we're on Skype, and I did the testing, and I think we're fine. So I'll just make sure we're actually recording. That should be. Yeah, we're recording. So... Uh, uh, yeah, we can just start. We don't have to make it too formal, but I'd like to start off just by saying, Russell, welcome to Truth Seekers Path. You are a truth seeker, and you have a path of high interest. You're very popular online. I did a, a search for your name, and I put Ukraine in quotes so that I would catch you specifically to Ukraine, and I came up with 273,000 Google searches and I, I went down to the 10th page and I looked and I saw all of them that I looked at were you. So I didn't look at all 270 something mm -hmm. thousand, but I did a, a few spot checks. You are very popular. I believe your popularity comes down to the charity work that you've done, which is a lot, the defense work that you've done, which is a lot, and heartwarming and also exciting parts of it, um, and your philosophy on life. You call yourself a poet. Yeah, that's uh, what I what I would be doing if uh, I wasn't busy doing something else. Okay, that's something else we're going to get to. I guess this can be um, you talking most of the time or you just waiting to be prompted. It's totally up to you. Uh, I'd like to get into your wake up. So that's the foundational question for everyone here. We all have a story who consider ourselves truth seekers, truth truthers. What, what mm -hmm. is your wake up, sir? When did you wake up and can you describe that moment or that period? Well, I'm 57 years old. I was born in 1960. I grew up in uh, Texas, uh, Dallas, Texas, actually. And I, I, I lived in Dallas when Kennedy was assassinated. I remember it. And as I was growing up, it was the Vietnam War when I was like junior high school, a young teenager. I started reading uh, Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh. I understood that there wasn't really a good reason for the American military to be in Vietnam and that the people, the Vietnamese were really defending their country against foreign invaders. And so, I and so I just always kind of had a different perspective from the general perspective of people in the United States. And as I grew up, um, my first job when I was 17, um, I was actually a illegal immigrant worker in Mexico. I got a job uh, welding in a factory across the river. I lived in Brownsville, right on the border. Um, there was um, very little, very little um, um, uh, uh, jobs to be found in Brownsville. Brownsville. There was a big city in Mexico right across the river. I went over there and got a job. And I was literally an illegal immigrant worker in Mexico. And so from that experience, you know, I kind of had uh, the understanding of what it was like for Mexican immigrants coming to the United States. You know, the, the proletariat working class perspective. And uh, just and, uh, as life went, as on, life went on, in the 1980s and early 90s, uh, uh, I learned a lot about the Iran-Contra Iran affair, affair where the CIA was CIA uh, funding terrorists and terrorists bringing cocaine, and cocaine into cocaine the United into States. The United States. Um, um, and so I understood that there was a lot of things that weren't really like that we were being told they were. 
Then, of course, uh, Yugoslavia in the 90s. Um, you know, the, uh, the attack on the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, where the uh, ATF murdered all those people, uh, stuff like that. Then, you know, 9-11 happens. And I remember, of course, as everyone does, exactly where they were. I was coming to work. Uh, that morning, that morning, and uh, uh, my boss was uh, watching boss TV. TV. It's like, man, they blew up the World Trade Center. And at first, I thought, well, you know, considering all that we've done against uh, the Arab world, um, you know, you can't really blame them if they hit back. And you know, I would think that the World Trade Center, you know, being a uh, a huge symbol of capitalism. Um, you know, and, and I mean, and literally a de facto center of capitalism, not just symbolic. I thought, well, they picked a good target. You know, I mean, better to hit a bunch of oligarchs than to hit a football game or a subway station or something like that to strike their work people. And then, of course, I started looking into that. Uh, when I was in the American Army, I was trained as a demolition specialist. So I know how to, you know, blow up bridges and roads and buildings, and I know how to do it, and I know what it looks like. And you know, they, you know, people still they say, "Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist." No, I know for a fact what it looks like to blow up a building through controlled demolition. That is exactly what happened with uh, World Trade Center Seven, without question. And, 99% of what happened to one and two as well. World Trade Center 7 was a controlled coalition. So I knew that there's only a certain set of people that were capable of setting up that. And so I understood that our government, the, or rather the U.S. government, is the enemy not only of the people of the United States, but of the world. And you know, then came Iraq, then Libya came, and Libya really, really made me very upset because a lot of people never really understood what Muammar Gaddafi did in that country, but it had the highest standard of living in Africa, free housing, free electricity for residential use, free medical care, free education, through college, and everything like that. Um, um, and people that say, oh, Muammar Gaddafi was a dictator, dictator, if actually they understood what what he did for the people of Libya, they would wish that they had a dictator like that. And when he was murdered by the U.S. and NATO, uh, Libya was, you know, was, the whole nation was destroyed. It's a hellhole now. It is the uh, is the headquarters of ISIS, it is the terrorist headquarters of the world. And so that was all the work of the United States. It really made me mad. And then when I saw Maidan happen, the, starting the attacks, you know, Odessa when we burned all those people at the trade union center. Um, that was, that was when I decided, well, I'm going to have to do more than just uh, write about it on Facebook. And I made the decision to come here. Um, it was a life-changing decision. I was, you know, I, to be honest, I didn't really expect to survive through the winter. And it was, it was very, very, very tough. And I was very lucky. I did survive. I spent six months uh, six at the front, uh, at the front as, a as a combat soldier, and um, uh, in the reserves now, but now I concentrate now more on uh, information warfare and uh, humanitarian aid. That's a fantastic roundup. Thank you very much. I never heard it put together like that, very condensed. It seems to me that you were always sort of awake from a very early age and then you just your your anger was boiling. Would that be a fair? Uh, yeah, as these I mean, events were happening. And I, I mean, and I'm not like really an angry person. It's not so much that I'm angry. It's just that 
I demand justice. I demand justice. Not just for myself, for my family, or for my country, but injustice, you know, war crimes anywhere in the world uh, offends me deeply. I hate bullies. I think many people who watch you um, feel the same way and, and they like your as a role model, you've shown people one way of standing up. Not all of us are soldiers. Uh, mm -hmm. Not all of us are willing to put our lives on the line and turn our backs on our entire uh, childhood history, uh, family, uh, friends, connections. Well, that may not be the case, but this is at risk any, regardless. Uh, sure. You've done a lot. But, you've but, given but, a lot. I mean, everybody has a part to play in making a more just and sustainable world. Not, I mean, like right now, I don't, I don't, I spend very little time percentage at the front as a soldier with a gun in my hand these days. And there's, I mean, there's, there's a way for everybody to help wherever they are to make the world a better place. Well said. Was there a reason why you picked Donbass, or, or did that come about at a timing when you were ready to make that sort of a move, or was there an affinity that you had somehow, or did uh, you have some relations? Of no, uh, my, my grandmother was from Romania, so I have a little bit of blood from the region, but generally it was just that I considered Don Bass to be the spear points of the war worldwide war against fascism. Don Bass in Syria, and, you know, I could have gone to Syria too. I have several friends that have worked there, but I just ended up here. Yeah, I totally get that. Don Bass the the and uh, and Syria especially Donbass, it seems that they've been targeting Ukraine for a long time and they've been agitating Russia for a long time and Russia is the goal for the resources, for the size, for the defense, for the sovereignty. A lot of reasons why, and it's been like that for a long time. Hundreds of years. Yeah. yeah. Hundreds of years, literally. Yeah, literally. It's amazing. And you're right, right in the hotbed. Where do you th think, uh, I'll just jump forward just a little bit, um, Russell, where do you think things are going now? I know there's been some, as usual, uh, rumors of war periodically, and mm -hmm. sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It usually ends up with civilians getting killed first, which is absurd. It, it's happening everywhere, not just in, in Ukraine, as you know. It's, as you know, it's happening in Syria as well. The first people they hit are the civilians because, when, as I was told, when you knock out children in your family, you're finished. So you're not a fighter anymore. Or at least that's that's one of the reasons that were given to me. Well, I mean, I know, uh, yeah, I mean, and sometimes it probably works that way, but on the other hand, um, when I first got here and I was in basic training, <clears throat> there was a kid that was in the group that I was in, and he was maybe 18 years old. And he got up, he was from Gorlovka, he got up one morning, his mom said, hey, go to the store and get some milk or something. He went to the store, while he was at the store, he dropped shells, uh, he came home, uh, both his parents and his younger brother were killed, and uh, so, you know, and he, from then on, you know, I mean, he was, uh, he was very, very interested in uh, killing Ukrainian Nazis. You know, and, and, yeah. and, somebody and somebody like that, like that there's, I mean, there's, I mean, you know, they don't really care about really anything care else. All they want to do is get, get revenge, which is understandable. Which is understandable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Where do you see this going now, uh, Russell? Is it trend, is it stalled, or is it preparing for some more it is, confrontation? It is. It's it's really impossible to predict. Although sometimes I try, I'm very uh, seriously concerned that the Ukrainians will make a major assault uh, either before or during the football championships, the soccer championships, and 
in Russia that start in June. Um, that would be a good time you know, tactically for them when the Russian government and security apparatuses are occupied with you know keeping that safe. Uh, it's a you know it's like a fifteen billion dollar deal for Russia. So if they start the war before that and the, the football championship gets canceled, uh, Russia will lose uh, you know fifteen billion dollars. So I mean, the thing is, you know, it's not like uh, Chicken Little or you know one of those dudes with the sign that says the end is near. You know. Five kilometers from where I'm sitting right now is the Ukrainian army with tanks and artillery, machine guns, and who knows what else. You know, but definitely all of that for sure, and they use it every day, every night. My godfather here, he's a Russian Orthodox priest, and uh, he works with a particular battalion here, and, you know, three or four days every week he performs funerals. Or guys, our guys, our soldiers that got killed, you know, and so, you know, it's, you know, it's, and you know, and it's like every couple of months through the whole three years plus that I have been here, every couple of months they say, oh, the crops are getting ready to make the big attack, and they haven't yet, but there's 100,000 soldiers sitting along the the contact line, and. Ukrainian soldiers, they're not there for a picnic, you know, there's a reason that they're there, it's, it, it costs to keep them there, and you know, and they're not there for nothing, and they're not very far away from where I'm sitting right now. Some people say that the Russian military is there in Donbass, I've talked to people on the ground who said that that's not true, other than the odd defector or, or person who just wants to be there. But they uh, report that this is a com nearly completely, if not completely, homegrown uh, army uh, as far as the personnel are concerned. Is that accurate? That is exactly that true. Is if exactly the, true. If the Russian military, if the Russian regular army <coughs> was, here, was here, the war would be over, in, be uh, over in, uh, a week at the most. At the most. You know, I mean, if the Russian if army. The Russian army wanted to fight Ukraine, they wouldn't come to Bogondas, they would go straight to Kiev, you know? And so it is, you know, more than 90% of the people in the military here are from here. There are volunteers from other countries, there's a fair amount of volunteers who came here from Russia, but not, not sent here as military units or even as active duty soldiers but just veterans or you know guys that just wanted to come and help um but as far as internationalists uh, i was last night with a friend of mine who came here from uh holland the netherlands um there's german volunteers there's italian spanish um I'm not the only American here. Uh, there's uh, Colombian that's here that I know. A guy from India that I know that came here. So I mean, it, you know, there is an international group of volunteers also, but the Russian the Russian army is not here. They do not work here. Okay, I had to ask that question because it's always being asked. And uh, thanks for bringing up those other points. Um, where do you? How, how many times do civilians get bombed versus? Uh, so uh, let's let's break down the civilian deaths to the to the soldier uh, to the fighting person's deaths. I know there there. I've seen you walk through villages many times. Mm -hmm. I've seen you point out the holes and the missing walls and the missing houses, and. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's very sad to see that deliberate shelling of civilians, and there's a purpose for that that we we touched on. What about is that is that ongoing? One, one thing I don't know. I know it happens periodically, for four years or so. Is that correct? And yeah, is yeah. it is it a, is it a daily, a weekly? Is it a how how often does it come in phases? Um, the civilians, the civilians that live close to the front line. Front line 
Um, civilians get bombed every day and every night. Every day and every night. And, of course, the front line, our defense positions on the front also. I, I don't think that there's a single day that either, I mean, that the front and civilian areas haven't been targeted since I've been here. And I've been here since December 2014. It's very sad, and that's not published at all. And they still run this psyop about Russia being in Ukraine when it's NATO fully in Ukraine, handpicked puppets in Kiev mm -hmm. from Victoria Nuland. And, and, and they do have the OSCE, the European uh, security guys that are here, and they are uh, generally despised by our side. Um, people that do the actual work, the actual monitors, are generally uh, well-intentioned people. But this guy, uh, Alexander Hoog, who is the director of the OSCE in, in Ukraine, he is an absolute Nazi collaborator. Um, uh, since since we're doing this on YouTube and not uh, the radio, I can say he is a real piece of shit. He is, he is a liar. He, he covers up facts that that are inconvenient or detrimental to the Ukrainians, and uh, and he promotes uh, Ukrainian propaganda. The fact is, and it has been uh, analyzed and determined, more than 90% of the civilians killed in this war have been killed on our side by the Ukrainian army. More than 90%. And yet, you get these uh, people that say, oh, well, you know, of course, <coughs> civilians are getting killed on both sides. And that's really... Uh, um, you know, it's uh, misdirection and propaganda. You know, because it's more than 90% of the civilians are getting killed on our side. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like with the, the Palestinians and uh, Israel. You know, so, yeah, well, you know, both sides, you know, it's a clash. But when 90% of people are getting killed on one side, it's something different. So the OSCE is completely compromised at the top level that reports to uh, wherever they report to UN. Yeah, well, they make uh, public reports. I mean, it's they're they're financed by Europe, and and they are completely compromised by their director in Ukraine, uh, Alexander Hu. What? Let's define Nazi. A lot of people hear that word, and it's thrown around quite often. What is your mm -hmm. definition of Nazi in specific to the, the war that you're fighting, the battle that you're fighting? Well, in Ukraine, in Ukraine they have, they have um, uh, actual, actual Nazi, Nazi units. units. And I mean, dudes they that have dudes pictures have of Hitler, Hitler have swastika have tattoos. tattoos. Um, during the Second World War, there was a Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, Nazi collaborator named Stefan Bandera. And who actually collaborated with the German Nazis when they invaded Ukraine? I mean, he was in the, the Wehrmacht. He wore a German military uniform with swastikas and all that. And uh, they, you know, they have his portrait in the Ukrainian Parliament. They build statues to him. They name roads after him. And he was a genuine Heil Hitler Nazi. You know. And anybody that says Heil Hitler, well, that makes a pretty good definition of a Nazi. And they have quite a few of them. I mean, as far as and, and it's, I mean, it's not a rhetoric or hyperbole. These guys, you know, they dress up. I mean, I'm talking about people in Kiev, in Ukraine today. There are military units that use symbols from the German Nazi SS uh, that, you know, that give this kind of salute, you know, that have, you know, SS symbols on their helmets, uh, swastika tattoos, and, I mean, the definition of fascism, according to Benito Mussolini, who founded it, he said that fascism would better be called corporatism, because fascism is the merger between corporate and government power. And under that definition, by the guy who founded fascism, 
the United States, the United is, States also is also a country. country. There's another the thing. That you, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another thing you can look up. Uh, I can't remember who it was that wrote it. But it's called the uh, the 14 uh, points of fascism. There's 14 different things that all fascist uh, entities or governments have in common. You know, like militarism, sexism, racism. You know, it just goes right down the line. You know, and uh, so. I, you know, I'm not just saying, oh, he's a Nazi, you know, like uh, on Seinfeld or something, you know, soup Nazi. No, I don't mean, I'm not using it as rhetoric. I'm saying these guys that say Heil Hitler, that want to commit genocide here, you know, that are, you know, that are real war criminals. I mean, I'm not calling them Nazis because I don't like them. I'm calling them Nazis because they have a swastika and they say Heil Hitler. Very clear, Russell. Uh, Russell, I've heard some stories as well that actually made my blood boil about the type of action that they've done against harmless children, torture, horrible things that I, I don't even care to go into, but these are actions as well. I just, I just want to uh, spell out, there's a lot of eyewitness stories, victim stories, police uh, testimonies, uh, family uh, testimonies. It's common knowledge the kinds of things that happen when people are abducted by the Ukrainian military, especially the ones that have these mm -hmm. Nazi symbols on them, what, what happens to these people. And it's also common knowledge among us truthers what happens to at least a great number of people that are caught on your side, uh, as long as they're not mercenaries, they're treated quite well. So we have, again, this opposite view of how things are done in the West, compared to what is actually happening on the ground? Well, I mean, there, there are videos that I have personally seen of, uh, of the Azov Battalion burying a prisoner alive. I've seen them nail a prisoner to a cross, then set him on fire. Um, I've seen them uh, hang a, uh, uh, one of our militia guys and his pregnant wife. You know, I mean, these I have seen these videos, and they produce these videos to, you know, to terrorize, you know, our soldiers and our civilians here. You know, I mean, that's that's the whole thing. Their their weapon is fear, and that's what they try and do. They, I mean, they are true terrorists. But it doesn't work because people here are not the kind of people that get scared. You know, I mean, of course, we all hate war. No one hates war more than the people who have experience. And I have to say that uh, it is, you know, thanks to the the goodness and the genius of Vladimir Putin that the whole world has not experienced the third world war already because, you know, that's really what the United States and their lapdogs in Europe are pushing for now, you know. I mean, they're, they're trying to start the third world war and, you know, it is, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin could be considered a saint for, for not having hit back yet and for saving Saving us all, us the whole all, world, the whole world from, you know, that from, you know, tragedy. that tragedy. Yeah, I've never seen one guy uh, dance around 30 figureheads the way Vladimir Putin can do. I can't even imagine how he can uh, manage that, that force, the, the, the dollars, the people, the, the, uh, the military, the, but he, he somehow strings them along and, and, and fools them at every, at every corner. Or delays them, or um, gets a gets a, a gets a war to to slow down over in Syria. Uh, people gave him a lot of trouble. I, I in fact got into some trouble from a guy in Russia who who was angry at me for not because he he said Putin should go to Ukraine, but but he didn't, and I was I was like, well, it, it's gonna it. He's, he's doing what he's doing on a calculated reason. Then someone else got angry at me because Putin did go to Ukraine, he said. And, mm -hmm. and I, 
it, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding there based on the Western media. Yeah. Um, Indeed, and I can say this, you know, that, uh, you know, pretty much uh, I consider, you know, and, and of course Putin is not perfect. I do not agree with Vladimir Putin on everything he does. But the people who criticize his work, I consider, oh, I, I can only laugh at them because there's, there's not only no more competent person alive today in the world to deal with these situations than him. I mean, he is one of the uh, greatest men in history. I mean, based on his accomplishments. Um, no, I mean, and not just preventing the Third World War, but, you know, basically saving Russia. You know, I mean, one of the major countries in world history that was on its knees 30 years ago, basically for the last 20 years, it is through his work that it has, you know, gotten back on its feet and become actually a very uh, successful country. You know, I mean... Um, I, w I would honestly rather live in Russia than in the United States these days. Yeah. By far. By far. Well, there, there again, we see this difference. The Western media, hence the general population in the West, although they're waking up slowly, they still believe too much of the media propaganda that has pitted Putin as this horrible monster. And meanwhile, the U.S. is representing the altruistic savior of the world and everywhere they go death and destruction and pillage is left behind all the altruistic stated goals that the US wants to do don't happen but meanwhile if you just look at Putin and look at his actions and don't listen to what people say about him just look at him and listen mm -hmm. to what he says and look at what he's doing you see exactly what you what you said I mean, it's it's really pretty hard to argue with, you know. If you you know if you base it on facts and reason and reality, you know, Russia is. I mean, Russia just forgave twenty billion dollars worth of debt from Africa. You know, the United States doesn't do that. The IMF doesn't do that. The EU doesn't do that. They want every last penny. You know, and it, and it doesn't matter if the children have to starve; they want their money. Russia says, "Okay, you got, you know, you got your, you got problems in Africa. You know, you don't have enough money. Hey, twenty billion? Don't worry about it, bro. Don't worry about it." Fantastic. You know, that just goes to show. You know, I mean, human decency and morality. You know, you can you can count it on things like that. Well, you've, you've, you've changed your, your life, you've got uh, no regrets, you've left a big part of it behind, and you've accepted a better part in exchange. Um, when is the first time that you understood you were accepted there locally? W did you have a, a moment or a, some proof? Well, <clears throat> I, got, I got here in December of 2014. Um, my first day at the front at the Donetsk Airport was uh, December 31st, 2014, and really that was where, you know, I I made my reputation, where I made my friends, where people, I mean, and, and of course, people were skeptical, you know, I mean, not just wondering whether I was a spy or something like that, wondering whether I was, you know, just some weak American punk who was going to start crying about, oh, uh, you know, the food is cold or, you know, uh, I'm tired, I can't go do guard duty or something like that. But from from my first days in combat, I was uh, ready and willing to you know, to do any work, to take any risk that anybody else did. I didn't complain. You know, I, I never said no. I never said, oh, this is too hard. I did it. I mean, and believe me, it was hard, bro. It was unbelievably hard. But I did it. And so by that, 
I won the respect of the guys that I was working with at the front. And so when we went back, you know, when we had leave or something, these guys come back and the commander says, hey, how did Jay Haas do? They said, hey, he did great. You know, so from that, I mean, I earned the trust and respect of the people here by my actions, not by talk or you know BS or anything, but by what I did. If more of us, if more of us stood up for what we believed in, and like you said, it doesn't all have to be soldiering, but the mm -hmm. world would be a better place if we took took control over our frustrations and took some action. You know, I, I believe uh, it was Einstein who said it. I'm not sure if it was him, but it's a really great quote that I like to use. And it says, the answer to all the problems in the world are in the space between what people do and what they could do. Well said. Where, where does your where uh, what is your day what are your days like now so you're um, you're doing are you doing more work on the information side then the uh, yes yes I, I do a lot of writing I do uh, I work with a human human aid group here called Donbass humanitarian aid uh, we do a lot of work with schools and orphanages um, families that you know like say their house got hit and they need a new roof, you know, we help with building material, stuff like that. Um, and I do a fair amount of writing. I don't make as many videos these days as as I used to, but I'll probably be getting back into that here soon. But uh, basically, information for humanitarian aid. Um, you know, I am in the reserves of the Nova Russian Army. If, if there's a big assault or something like that, uh, I'll go back to the front, but in the meantime, um, I and my commanders both think that um, what I can do on the front is more important than uh, shooting snipers or digging ditches. Well, I'm glad you're spending your time here with us, and um, this is a the truth seekers path you've certainly had a very interesting path and it's and it continues and it started long before this and it will continue long after this god bless you uh russell it, it's it's been a fantastic um, interview so far what what is there anything you'd like to add i mean let's let's get it all out there how can people mm -hmm. contact you what are your biggest is a book yes uh <clears throat> my book should be it's it's, it's written it's right the final edit and formatting. It'll come out probably by the end of June. Uh, it'll be an ebook. Uh, it's called Don Bass Cowboy. Uh, it's about my first six months at the front. Um, I have a website, TexasBentley.com. Um, anybody, uh, all you have to do is Google me or do a YouTube search for Russell Bentley, Texas, Don Bass, anything like that. Like Tons that. of stuff will, stuff pop, will up. pop up. Um, um, and uh, uh, my uh, humanitarian, humanitarian organization is called Donbass Humanitarian Aid. Aid. It's, uh, it's uh, works, works in conjunction works with the Russian Orthodox, Orthodox Church, Church, and it's based in the United States, but we do work with uh, civilians. And, uh, civilians here. and I mean, and, and I mean, people, people need to, you know. Like you need to seek the truth, you know. I mean, and if people say, "Oh, well, there's no Nazis in Ukraine," just Google Ukrainian Nazis, see what comes up. You know, I mean, there's if you do that, you'll see thousands. I mean, literally thousands of pictures, torchlight parades, Nazi uniforms, and Heil Hitler. Literally, you know. I mean, so of course, Western media is. Uh, uh, it is a, you know, it's a propaganda tool. That's all it is. What this, it's like what Nikki Haley says in the United Nations. It has nothing to do with reality. It's just lies repeated over and over again. People with weak minds um, can be fooled by. But the truth is, there and seeking the truth is, it is the number one job of human beings is to understand reality. And I'm, I really appreciate uh, you interviewing me today. I'm really, 
Uh, I support your work, and I'm real glad to see what you're doing. It's important. Everybody has uh, a way to help, you know, whether it's, you know, holding a flag on the side on the street corner or making a video or making a donation or whatever, writing a letter to the editor of a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, there's, there's, there's some way for everybody to do it. And, and the world is now is based is is because people for too long just people take care of it. So people that care about the future of the world and about the future of humanity need to do their part and take their their part. Appreciate you for doing exactly that. Your program. Well, coming. Thanks, Russell. I. I speak for hundreds of thousands of people that have followed them actively as well. Right? Uh, it's it's great. There's a lot of them, but none as public as you, perhaps at least not in that region. And uh, yeah, it's it's inspiring to see someone just for what they believe is right and continue that fight. And I've know I know your heart is good. I see you with people. I see you with the orphanage with. Uh, and so many other people that I don't know the names of, uh, the assistance you give them financially, with food, with support, local help them out with. She went to uh, Kiev and, and TV shows there. They had some of it certainly enabled actions to come from this. Is the, this is what the fight is all about. It's a hybrid war, in fact. Doing the same back. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, sort of a person. Um, what network or person ha gives you the most success to get the word out? Because getting the word out is, I guess. Well, uh, well, uh, and just basically word of mouth. I mean, I have Facebook. I was on Twitter for a while, had several thousand followers. Get uh, 30 day bans on Facebook. Medium. I'm going I write for my own web page and some uh, that's F O R T which is uh, another I'm sure you've had hit pieces.
Just give everyone.